Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part through the generous support of our sponsors, including Aaron Ferguson Electric and Automation at AaronV.com, A-A-R-O-N-V dot com. Making connections for life for your automation and smart home needs in North and Central Florida. You're listening to episode 195 of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where we look at mysteries from the twin perspectives of faith and reason. In this episode, we're talking about poltergeists. I'm Don Bettinelli, and joining me today is Jimmy Akin. Hi, Jimmy. I'm here. (laughs) Folks, be sure to stick around to the end of the episodes, as we'll have your feedback on our recent episodes on Life on Mars. But first, for centuries, people have reported strange phenomena erupting around them. Objects start moving without anyone touching them. They fly across the room and bang into walls. Sometimes they hit and injure people. In the 1800s, a name was given to these frightening phenomena, poltergeists. So what are poltergeists? What's responsible for them? And what does the latest research reveal? Well, that's what we'll be talking about on this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World. So Jimmy, let's start right from the beginning. Where does the word poltergeist come from and what does it mean? It comes from the German language, which shares a common history with English. In German, Geist means spirit. Uh, Geist is the German form of the English word ghost, which also means spirit, which is why the Holy Spirit is sometimes referred to as the Holy Ghost. The other part of the word poltergeist is the German word poltern, which means to make noise or rattle. Based on its roots, a poltergeist would be a noisy ghost. Noises are often reported in poltergeist cases, and sometimes the noises are caused by moving or flying objects that crash into things, which is one of the characteristic phenomena of these cases. The term poltergeist was coined around 1838, but interestingly, it seems to have caught on more among English speakers than among Germans. I've read that in German, the poltergeist is more commonly called a spook, which, as you can hear, is the German equivalent of the English word spook. Let's look at an actual poltergeist case. We may talk about some famous poltergeist cases in the future, but can you give us a fairly straightforward one to get us started? In 1906, a smith, that is to say a metal worker, in Vienna, Austria, found his workshop being disrupted by a poltergeist. The story was then reported the next year, 1907, in the British Journal for the Society for Psychical Research. The Society for Psychical Research, or SPR, was and is a very prestigious organization that has had multiple Nobel Prize winning scientists as members. A Viennese member of the SPR named Varndorfer wrote up this account for the journal. He states, I had occasion to hear of a spook case in Vienna and to witness some of the alleged occurrences, and I report here what I heard from witnesses and what I saw for myself. At the beginning of this month, July 1906, I read in the Neues Wiener Tagblatt, or New Wiener Daily Paper, an account of a spook in a Vienna suburb relating in a jocular way that things were flying about in a smith's shop, that the owner of the shop was very much put out about it, and that the communal authorities would doubtless soon put a stop to this nonsense. Varndorfer then went to the workshop, which he describes as follows. The shop is at the end of a long court in a large house inhabited by tradespeople and workmen, and one goes down to it by a short open stair and along an open area. It is the last shop on the right of the house. Next to it is a shop where scales and weights are made. In the next house, there is a mechanic who uses a dynamo machine. The place I refer to is hired by a man called Job Zimmerl, aged, I think, 63. He works there with two apprentices, aged about 15 and 18. He has been in this place for about four years. The workshop is very poorly furnished with old machinery driven by hand and rather dark. Which is not that surprising, since this was 1906 and electric lights weren't always in general use. Oil lamps and gas lights were still common. Remember the fact, though, that the guy with the electric dynamo was next door, because that's going to be mentioned again. 
The man told me that he was very much disturbed by things, tools, bits of iron, screws, his pipe, etc., being thrown off the benches and flung about. He had a stiff hat on so as to protect his head against the objects. He showed me a lump on the back of his head caused, as he said, by a piece of iron. One of the boys had a red spot on his cheekbone caused in a similar way. So Herr Zimmer had been injured by a flying object and was now wearing a stiff hat for protection. Also, one of the boys had been struck in the face by a flying object. Since he was working with teenage apprentices, could one of them just have been throwing things when he wasn't looking? Varndorfer asked about that. He told me that he did not think his apprentices could have played him tricks as he had watched them and as objects had been flying about while they were outside and from a direction opposite to where they stood and where there was only solid wall. He had been to the police and some officials had been there to examine the walls, etc., but had found nothing unusual, the walls, etc., being solid and in good order. While I was there, an electrician came to examine the place with instruments of precision, as it was thought that the neighbor's dynamo might have caused electromagnetic currents. He found nothing at all. There were no electric or magnetic reactions whatever. So they checked out whether the guy with the dynamo next door could have accidentally caused the metal objects to be flying around the workshop. And I'm not surprised that they didn't find evidence of that. It would take an exceptionally powerful dynamo to cause objects in the next house over to start flying around across that distance with walls in the way. But in 1906, dynamos were less well understood by the public than they are now, and it made sense to check. In fact, paranormal investigators today still check for electromagnetic things that could be affecting the site of reported phenomena. And sometimes they find that electrical things are responsible. One of my professors at the Ryan Institute, Lloyd Auerbach, once investigated a case where high-tension power lines over a house turned out to be humming in a way that generated infrasound, low-frequency sound waves that were affecting the family that lived in the house. And there were several other factors affecting the family, all of which were natural, so Auerbach concluded that there was no ghost in this case. It was a haunting that wasn't. And we'll have a link to where you can read about it, but it shows that good parapsychologists check out the possible natural explanations and don't automatically assume that a ghost is involved. Let's go back to 1906. Did Varndorfer see any poltergeist activity himself in the workshop? Not on the first day he visited, but he went back a few days later. I found that all the tools had been removed from the shop into wooden boxes and put outside, the man being afraid to work while they were lying loose. He told me that a rather heavy hammer had whirled close past his head several times. He was much scared and lamented the loss of his time and the loss of customers, as some would not come near, being frightened, while others kept away from an old fool who talked such nonsense. The phenomena had increased, according to Zimmerl, in the boys' accounts. They had seen a pipe fly from one side of the shop to the other and back and settle on the anvil in the middle of the room. Once, the pipe was taken from Zimmerl's mouth and fluttered onto the turning lathe. Once, it got up by itself from a lying into a standing position on its clay head. It consists, as is customary here, of a long wooden stem with a clay head, and then made a vicious peck and broke its head. Zimmerl had by this time given up smoking in the shop on account of so many pipes having been broken. His notebook was said to have flown out of the window like a butterfly, and the hat of one of the boys had been removed from his head repeatedly. I remained there for about a couple of hours but saw nothing. I spoke to several neighbors who affirmed they had seen or heard things fly about. But eventually our reporter would see the phenomena. I came again next day, Saturday last, determined to remain for the whole day. When I arrived about 8.30, Zimmerl was just returning from some newspaper offices, where he had been to fetch reporters. He also brought a policeman with him. He was quite beside himself, two petroleum lamps having been smashed during the night, and by then seven window panes broken. Moreover, all his tools were mixed up. He dared not go into his shop and raved about the authorities not being able to stop such impossible goings-on and not protecting him, letting him be ruined, etc., etc. At 1.10 p.m., after the shop was closed for lunch, I found the boys just opening the place and carrying the boxes with tools outside. Shortly afterwards, Zimmerl arrived and started some job that he had to finish at once. 
During the next three hours, I saw, heard, or felt exactly 30 objects being thrown about. With about 12 or 15 objects, I am perfectly certain that none of the persons present can have thrown them. One of them was thrown when I was momentarily alone in the shop, coming apparently from the forge. I never saw any of the objects actually fly. With most of them, I heard only the fall. With some, I heard a slight noise, indicating the direction from which they came. Some dropped quite close to me. Three struck me on the head. Varndorfer also took steps to ensure that the young apprentices couldn't have just been throwing things. Later on, I was struck by a small blade of steel on the back of the neck, and the third time by a fragment of a clay pipe. This and some other small pieces which flew about I had deposited on a wooden shelf on the wall, where they were well out of the reach of the boy's ordinary manipulation. There were several people present, watching through the window and standing in the doorway, but I do not think any of them can be connected with the phenomenon. The key part of this is that he put objects on a high shelf that the boys or the others couldn't have reasonably got to, yet still the objects flew. He also saw one of the boys injured by an object. The last incident happened at about 4.30. The smith had gone out of the shop soon after the spook began, lamenting his fate and finding evidently some consolation in the curiosity of the neighbors to hear the latest developments. I stood most of the time in the middle of the shop, keeping my eyes on the boys, my back turned to the forge. About 4.30, I watched the boys drilling a hole in a piece of iron, their hands and evidently their attention being fully occupied. Suddenly, the younger of the two screamed out and was nearly bent double with pain and fright, while an iron measuring instrument flew onto the floor. It had struck him pretty sharply on the left temple, causing a swelling and a drop of blood. I had noticed the instrument a little time before lying on the workbench, about a yard behind the boy. So he saw the measuring instrument that struck the boy sitting three feet behind him on the workbench, and then, with the voices' faces turned towards the hole they were drilling, and with their hands occupied in the task, the measuring instrument apparently leapt off the workbench and struck the younger boy. I should note that this case is unusual in that the moving objects actually struck people and caused minor injuries. This is rather intense for a poltergeist case, and injuries don't often result. But note that even here, the injuries were very minor. According to a statistical study of 500 poltergeist cases that we'll hear about soon, people are harmed in only about 15% of the cases, and it tends to be very minor injuries like getting a scratch or feeling a pinch. What do you think is going on in this case? It's hard to say. I don't have a huge amount of information about this case, just the initial report published in the journal. And the article also includes some details we didn't go into. It's noteworthy that they did take steps to look for naturalistic explanations. They checked to see if the guy with the dynamo next door could be responsible, and he wasn't. Uh, both Herr Zimmerl and Herr Warndorfer kept a careful eye on the apprentices and other people. Herr Warndorfer even put objects on a shelf to keep them out of reach, and they flew anyway. And once Herr Warndorfer saw an object fly when he was alone in the shop and nobody else was around. If the reports are accurate, it at least sounds like something paranormal was happening. But we don't have a full investigative report, just a brief article from one witness. In future episodes, we'll look at better documented poltergeist cases and see what we can do to solve them. But I wanted to include this one just to give people a sense of what poltergeist cases are said to involve sometimes. How far back in history do reports of poltergeist go? In terms of documented cases, the earliest I'm aware of occurred in Ravenna, Italy in AD 530, so almost 1,500 years ago, and they've been reported periodically ever since, though they only began to be more intensely studied in recent times. The Vienna workshop case involved objects being thrown about, but you said that sometimes there are just noises reported without objects moving. Are there other phenomena reported in poltergeist cases? There are, and in his 1979 book, Poltergeists, which he co-authored with A.D. Cornell, author Alan Gold conducted a statistical review of 500 poltergeist cases to look for common characteristics, clusters of characteristics, and changes in characteristics over time. The chapter in his book that covers the study is called 
poltergeists and the computer. Because back in 1979, running your data through a computer was like a big deal. <laughs> um, today, you typically don't even bother mentioning the statistics software you were using, but Galt wanted to make it clear to his readers exactly how his calculations were done. And he goes into some detail about precisely how he used the computer to do cluster analysis on the data. It's good that he documents that for his 1979 readers because he's showing his research methods so they can be examined by others. But from a 2022 perspective, it's rather quaint as modern software would do all this kind of stuff automatically. Where did he get the data for his study? From historical accounts, going back to the Ravenna case in AD 530, he looked at accounts recorded in books and excluded those that were only mentioned in newspapers or magazines due to press accounts being less carefully prepared. He also classified the cases based on the amount of information that was available about them. Gauld explains, Each case report was broken down in the following manner. First of all, the value of the testimony was rated on a scale from 1 to 10. Ratings were based primarily on such points as whether the testimony was firsthand or secondhand, whether there was more than one witness, how soon after the events the testimony was set down, whether or not there was instrumental recording. Thus, a case report, which consisted merely of a distant recollection of a secondhand story, would be rated 1. A case report, which consisted of incorporated or was immediately based upon continuous instrumental recordings by competent persons would have rated 10 had there been one. By assigning cases ranks that were based on the amount of information available, he could then weight them so that a case with little information available would not be weighted as highly as one that had been thoroughly documented. He then took the reports from the 500 cases and tagged them according to 63 different characteristics. These included things like where the report came from, whether trickery was detected, or whether a natural explanation had been found, and bunches of other things. Here are some examples of different elements he looked for in the case reports. Small objects moved. Large objects moved, for example, chairs or tables. Objects move as if carried. Objects appear in midair, seem to pass through ceilings, etc. Raps, etc. Imitative and miscellaneous noises. Voices, groans, whistles, etc. Misty figures, etc. Seen. Luminous effects. Incendiary effects, that is, fire starting. Objects thrown or transported found to be hot. Inundations of water, etc. Cloth, clothes, etc. Cut torn, etc. Assault, pinches, blows, scratches, etc. Animals attacked or annoyed. Possession, obsession. Levitation, etc. of human body. Doors, windows, opened, shut. Latches, door handles seen to move. Locks turned, keys moved. Marked stones, etc. thrown away and returned. Plants uprooted, damaged filth and excrement thrown or spread, etc. And others. He then looked at how common and uncommon these different things were. He found that in about two-thirds of the cases, there were movements of small objects. In about half of the cases, there were rapping sounds. Large objects, like tables and chairs, were moved in about a third of the cases. Phantasms of human-like figures appeared in about 30% of the cases, and there were voices or groaning sounds in about a quarter of the cases. Those represent the most common reported phenomena, things like fires starting, people's hair being cut, or people being injured or attacked were less common. You mentioned that he looked for changes in the phenomena over time. What did he find in this regard? There were some changes, and these tended to be correlated with changes in society. Gauld writes, if inundations of water have been more frequent, and the flinging or spreading of excrement less frequent in the later period than in the earlier, that is no doubt because water pipes have become common, and cesspits rare during the last 100 years. Very possibly, a further analysis of the kinds of small objects thrown by poltergeists 
would reveal analogous changes. And that makes sense. With modern plumbing, we don't have chamber pots or open cesspits, so you wouldn't expect excrement getting thrown around. On the other hand, there have been recent cases where telephones were tossed about, and you wouldn't have had that before a certain point in history when telephones came into common use. You said Gauld did cluster analysis to see if the data fell into groups. Why did he do that? Because it could shed light on whether there is more than one type of poltergeist or whether there's more than one explanation that was involved in the cases. What he found was that the data tended to cluster primarily into two groups, one of which fit the classic poltergeist pattern and the other of which better fit the classic haunting pattern. He described cluster one, or the poltergeist pattern, like this. Cluster 1 is rich in short-lived, person-centered, especially young person-centered, cases, and in cases in which objects are displaced, thrown, or even carried through the air. And he described Cluster 2, the haunting pattern, like this. Cluster 2 is rich relatively to Cluster 1 in long-lasting and primarily nocturnal cases, in cases centering on a house, in cases characterized by raps, imitative noises, voices, phantasms, luminous effects, and in cases in which doors are opened and door handles seem to move. So the poltergeist pattern cases lasted a shorter time, seemed to focus on people, especially young people, and involved objects being moved, while the haunting pattern cases lasted longer, seemed to be focused on a house rather than a person, and involved different phenomena like noises, voices, and visual manifestations like phantasms or odd lights. Do other parapsychologists distinguish between these two categories? Yes. Hauntings, apparitions, and poltergeists are three major categories that paranormal field investigators commonly examine. The distinguishing characteristic of a poltergeist case are that it tends to be focused on a person and involves moving objects. The distinguishing characteristic of a haunting are that it tends to be focused on a location and involves a pattern that seems to repeat without a lot of variation. And the distinguishing characteristic of an apparition is that it tends to involve a personality that changes its behavior rather than just repeating a pattern so you can interact and communicate with the personality. We'll talk more about all of these in future episodes. We're going to get to our theories and faith and reason perspective in just a second. But first, I want to take a moment to thank our patrons who make this show possible, including the W family, Jim B, Jacob P, Simon R, and Gregory F. Their generous donations at sqpn.com slash give make it possible for us to continue Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World and all the shows at StarQuest. You can join them by visiting sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Catechism Class, a dynamic weekly podcast journey through the Catechism of the Catholic Church by Greg and Jennifer Willits. It's the best book club, coffee talk, and faith study group all rolled into one. Find it in any podcast directory. And by Fear Vento Law, PLLC, specializing in adult guardianships and conservatorships, probate and estate planning matters. Accepting clients throughout Michigan, take into account your individual health care, financial, and religious needs. Visit fearventolaw.com. F I O R V E N T O law.com. So, Jimmy, what theories are there about poltergeists? There are two basic classes of explanations natural ones and paranormal ones. Under natural explanations, we have to consider things like fraud misinterpretation, and natural physical phenomena. Under paranormal explanations, we have to consider things like ghosts, demons, and psychic functioning. So what can we say about poltergeists from the faith perspective? Are demons responsible for poltergeist phenomena? Demons are fallen angels, and the biblical record shows that angels are able to affect material objects, despite the fact that they don't themselves have physical forms. In other words, angels and demons have what we would call telekinesis or psychokinesis. They can mentally affect matter. Given that, there's no reason in principle why a demon couldn't cause a poltergeist case. However, as we discussed in episode 188 on whether it's always demons, we can't just leap 
to that conclusion. We need evidence that a demon rather than something else is involved. For a Christian to reflexively insist on the demon conclusion is the religious equivalent of an atheist reflexively insisting that all poltergeists must be the result of fraud and trickery. Both explanations are possible, but in a specific case, you need evidence to support your proposed explanation. What kind of evidence would support the demon hypothesis? There's a bit of an impediment uh, to it in that we never see demons doing poltergeist-like things in Scripture. That's not to say that they can't do them, but it's not what we see in the biblical record, so we don't have a precedent for it. And, as we discussed in episode 188, just because something is frightening or dangerous doesn't mean it's a demon. There are lots of things in the world that are frightening and dangerous, but that aren't demons. Also, as we discussed, one of the key signs of demonic involvement is the manifestation of an alternative personality, as in the case of possession. If you've got evidence that you'd need to diagnose a case of possession, then you could infer demonic involvement. But you shouldn't just leap to this conclusion. Another piece of evidence would be if you tried an exorcism and it worked. In Gauld's 1979 study of 500 poltergeist cases, he found that exorcism was tried in some instances. In 34 cases, the exorcism worked. In 16 cases, the exorcism failed. And in nine cases, it was ambiguous, where the exorcism first seemed to work but ultimately failed. In those cases where the exorcism seemed to work, that would be at least some additional evidence supporting demonic involvement. And in the cases where it failed, that would be at least some evidence suggesting it wasn't demonic involvement. Although, in neither set of cases would this be decisive evidence. An exorcism may appear to work, but it may have been due to something else, like the poltergeist case ceasing on its own, and these cases are often short-lived temporary things. And when the exorcism didn't work, it could be because exorcism doesn't always work. So whether the exorcism seemed to work or not, it would be some evidence, but it wouldn't be conclusive. What about the possibility that it isn't a demon, but a human ghost that's responsible for a poltergeist case? This also has to be taken seriously. In some ways, that's the historical default hypothesis, because poltergeist means noisy ghost or noisy spirit, not noisy demon specifically. Ghosts are real, and they sometimes manifest to people. If spirits, in general, have the ability to affect matter, like angels do and like we do in this life, since we can clearly control our own bodies, then there's no reason why a human spirit that's not confined to a body might not be free to influence physical objects in the environment. As before, a key piece of evidence as to whether a ghost is involved would be whether you have evidence that an alternative personality is involved, like a spirit that you can interact and communicate with. In this case, you'd need to ask the question of whether it's a demonic spirit or a human one. If you don't have evidence that it's a demonic spirit, then it would be logical to conclude that it's a human spirit, a ghost. If it is a human spirit, it wouldn't seem to be acting like one of the saints during a heavenly apparition. They don't typically throw objects around. No, though, I wouldn't rule that out altogether. Uh, sometimes people on Earth need a bit of tough love, and I can't rule out the possibility that a heavenly spirit, whether human or angelic, might need to put the fear of God into people or administer a little bit of divine justice. And we do see angels doing that in the Bible. But those aren't the only possibilities. As we discussed in episode 106 on St. Thomas Aquinas and the Occult, St. Thomas held that souls in purgatory and the souls of the damned can appear to the living. In the Summa Theologia, he wrote, It is also credible that this may occur sometime to the damned, and that from man's instruction and intimidation they be permitted to appear to the living, or again, in order to seek our suffrages, as to those who are detained in purgatory. So maybe a soul in purgatory is acting out in some way to get attention and it's perceived as frightening, or maybe a damned soul is acting out in some way that's deliberately harmful. We can't rule out these possibilities in principle. It depends on the evidence we have for what's happening in a particular case. 
All right. So what can we say about poltergeist from the reason perspective? You mentioned the possibility of fraud. What can we say here? Fraud is real. It happens a lot. In fact, paranormal field investigators are taught to look for natural explanations first. And in a poltergeist case, fraud is one of the first things they should consider. One of the things paranormal investigators have found, including Galt in his 1979 study, is that poltergeist cases frequently seem to center on a specific individual. Uh, this person may be present at all or most of the manifestations, such as when objects move. While poltergeist cases can center on a person of any age, they often center on a young person, such as a teenager or young adult. Youth is a time of particularly passionate emotions, and it's also a time when people can act in an immature manner because they're not mature yet by definition. Uh, furthermore, paranormal investigators have noted that the person at the center of a poltergeist case often seems to be experiencing stress and frustration, which are also characteristic of certain times in life, like youth, which can be filled with angst. So it's quite easy to imagine that to deal with their frustrations, a young person may surreptitiously start throwing objects around. That way, they might get rid of some stress without being blamed for it, since they didn't throw the objects openly, and they might use the cultural idea of a poltergeist as an alternative explanation for their behavior. Thus, angsty teenager doing a hoax is an easy explanation for what's happening in a poltergeist case. And by the way, to any teenagers listening right now, your parents have been warned. <laughs> that includes my kids. So <laughs> does that mean we should assume that a given poltergeist case should be explained by the angsty teenager hypothesis? If there's a teenager on the scene that the phenomena seem to center around, we should definitely consider it. In fact, when I start considering a poltergeist Poltergeist case that I'm reading about, I immediately consider this option. But we can't simply assume that this is the case and insist on it. In the first place, reflectively insisting on any one hypothesis means that you're not using critical thinking to weigh the evidence. You're simply declaring your preferred narrative to be the truth instead of looking at evidence. In the second place, insisting on the angsty teenager hypothesis is the materialistic equivalent of insisting on the demon hypothesis. Both fail to take the actual evidence seriously in favor of your preferred narrative if you just insist it has to be this. And the fact is that there are other possible explanations, both natural and paranormal. You mentioned misinterpretation as another possible normal explanation. How could misinterpretation be responsible for poltergeist reports? Apart from the cases of natural physical phenomena that we'll discuss in a minute, people can misperceive the cause of a normal event and attribute it to a poltergeist. For example, lapses of memory can cause this. I mean, suppose that you've put your car keys on the kitchen counter and you remember that, but then later you move them to the coffee table and you forget that you moved them. Later, when you walk up and see them on your coffee table, but all you remember is they were on the kitchen counter, you might conclude that they've been mysteriously moved by a poltergeist. Or you may neglect the fact that there are natural agents in your house that could have moved the objects without your being aware of it. I mean, suppose you come into your bedroom one day and you see everything you expected to see in its place scattered all over the floor in a big chaotic mess. Well, you might conclude that this was due to a poltergeist, but this might be a misperception if you have small children or pets living with you. It may have been the small children or pets that ran wild in your bedroom and created the mess. In these cases, it would not be a failure to remember moving the objects yourself that was responsible for the misperception. It would be failing to consider that it could have been the children or pets that could have done it. It's also possible that your misperception could have been caused by talking to other people. What do you mean by that? How could talking to other people cause you to misperceive something as being due to a poltergeist? Humans are social creatures, and what other people say to us has an influence on how we perceive things and what we believe. Suppose that you've been in your home and seen objects moved 
that you have no explanation for how they moved. Unknown to you, it's really for one of the reasons we've just covered. Uh, you moved them and forgot, the children moved them, or the pets moved them, but you aren't thinking of those possibilities. And a fellow adult says, if you've seen objects moved with no explanation, that's a classic sign of a poltergeist. You may have a poltergeist in your house. And so you conclude there is a poltergeist in your house. You've misperceived the event because of what you've been told. It's even possible for people to manufacture memories without realizing it based on what they've been told. How is that possible? How could you accidentally manufacture a memory? Well, suppose that you and a group of five friends are at home during an evening, and all five of your friends remember seeing an object move with no apparent cause. If they describe what they saw to you, you may start picturing the object moving in your mind, and the confidence that they display in the fact that that's what really happened leads you to start feeling confident in your visualization of the event. And especially after a bit of time has passed, your memory gets fuzzy about the fact you didn't personally perceive it move, but the visualization that's stored in your memory can get misinterpreted as an actual memory. And studies have shown that this kind of thing can happen. If you start visualizing something, after a while you can forget that it was just a visualization and not a memory. You mentioned that natural physical phenomena could be responsible for poltergeist reports. What were you talking about here? Well, even if there wasn't a misunderstood living agent like yourself, a child, or a pet involved, there could be other natural explanations for why an object might move. For example, suppose that a family in a poltergeist case reports seeing an object roll across the floor for no apparent reason. Is it a poltergeist pushing the object, or is it the fact that their floor is not level? It's instead been built on a slight imperceptible incline so that any round object will naturally roll across it. Or perhaps since it was built, the house has begun to lean slightly in one direction because of subsidence in the ground, or because the supports on one side of the house have been weakened. In both cases, you might get a small tilt that would explain certain objects to start rolling off counters or tables or across the floor. What are some other natural explanations that might explain things reported in poltergeist cases? A painting might tilt or suddenly fall off the wall if the nail it's hung on is under stress from the weight of the painting and eventually it bends or gives way. Temperature and moisture changes in the wood of the wall could lead to the nail becoming loose. Underground seismic tremors could vibrate it so that it bends or becomes loose. So could people moving around in the house or heavy vehicles going by on the road outside or the house settling on its foundation. Or maybe you've got small animals, even ones you don't know about, like rats or possums that are in your attic or walls and making noise. Or branches or pine cones are falling on the roof. Or a bird is smacking into a window and you don't see it, but it makes noise. In fact, houses make noise during the course of the day for all kinds of reasons, especially due to temperature changes. But if you're primed with the idea that a poltergeist may be in your house, these purely natural physical phenomena could be misunderstood as something the poltergeist is doing. So there are lots of options. You mentioned one other possibility for poltergeist, which is that psychic functioning might be involved. Why do you say that and why are we considering it under the reason perspective? We're considering it from the reason perspective because the existence or non-existence of psychic functioning is not a matter of faith. Psychic abilities are claimed to be weak, natural abilities that are part of human nature, so it's a matter for science to determine whether or not they exist. And, based on their findings in the field, many parapsychologists are of the opinion that it is actually psychic functioning that is responsible for most poltergeist cases, or at least the poltergeist cases that aren't purely natural in their causes, you know, poltergeist cases where something paranormal is happening. Specifically, they think that psychokinesis is responsible for many of these cases. And why do they think that? You recall that one of the things they discovered when investigating field reports of poltergeists was that they're often centered around a person rather than a place. 
That person, for example, would typically be present for most or all of the instances where the objects moved. That immediately raises the question of fraud, whether this person is surreptitiously causing the objects to move. But in many cases, they were able to eliminate the possibility that this person or anyone else was moving the objects through conventional means, like, you know, sneaking around and throwing them. So there was a residue of cases where the hoax explanation didn't work. And the investigators said, well, let's follow the evidence. The evidence suggests that this person is responsible for the moving objects. So they are moving the objects. But the evidence suggests that they're not moving them through normal means. So they must be moving them through paranormal means. In other words, they're using psychokinesis or PK as it's known. Since the PK began to manifest spontaneously in this case without the person trying to move objects, they thus called these incidents spontaneous psychokinesis. And since the spontaneous psychokinesis didn't happen just once, but kept recurring over a period of time, they called these incidents recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis or RSPK. The term recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis was coined in the 20th century by Danish-born researcher William Roll and his fellow researcher J. Gaither Pratt. And today, RSPK is thought to be responsible for many instances of poltergeist phenomena. So in these cases, the person responsible for the phenomena, the poltergeist agent, that is causing them would be a living person, a living agent rather than a deceased agent like a ghost. Earlier, we mentioned a statistical study by Alan Gauld, but there have been additional studies and they indicate a strong correlation between poltergeists and particular individuals. The Society for Psychical Research's Psy Encyclopedia article on the psychological aspects of poltergeist cases states, a possible human connection to the phenomena was more broadly confirmed in the 1970s through a survey of 116 poltergeist cases reported between 1612 and 1974 by parapsychologist William Rawl. He found that the phenomena in 92 cases, 79%, seemed to be associated with a particular individual or two individuals in certain instances. Similarly, in a 1989 survey of 54 German poltergeist cases, Monica Husman and Friedrich Schreiber found that 63% were linked to a living person. Recognizing the human connection, Rawl and fellow parapsychologist J. Gaither Pratt proposed that poltergeist phenomena might be large-scale displays of psychokinesis, caused sporadically and involuntarily by the individual most closely linked to it, often referred to as the agent. In 1958, they coined the term recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis, RSPK, as an alternate means of conceptualizing poltergeist phenomena. So, Roll's study found 79% of poltergeist cases seem to be linked to a particular individual, and Husman's and Shriver's study found that to be the case in 63% of the cases they studied. When we discuss the possibility of fraud, you mentioned that the person at the center of poltergeist cases was often a young person who's experiencing a significant amount of stress. How does that fit with the RSPK explanation? It fits quite well. Young people often experience stress. Uh, some of this is produced by biological changes as they're maturing. It also can include life changes like moving to a new town or having a new stepfather or stepmother or if your parents divorce. And sometimes they can be put through trauma like child abuse or being tormented by their peers. And whatever the cause of the stress a particular person is going through, it's thought that this stress subconsciously triggers the person's psychokinetic abilities so that they start recurrently and spontaneously manifesting. The idea is that if they're really stressed and frustrated and they can't act on their frustrations through normal means, their subconscious starts acting it out psychokinetically. This is essentially what happens in Stephen King's novel, Carrie. 
In the book and the movie that was based on it, teenager Carrie White is emotionally abused by her mother and publicly tormented and humiliated by her peers at school in a very dramatic way. And all the frustration she's experiencing triggers her psychokinetic abilities and causes them to go out of control. So Stephen King was basing the novel on actual parapsychological ideas, though as a horror novelist, he dramatically ramped them up to make the story more compelling. And if you read the book, Carrie ends up causing destruction on a massive scale. Does the RSPK hypothesis mean that poltergeists are never caused by spirits? No, in any paranormal case, all possibilities must be investigated, and it can turn out that a given case has multiple causes. It would be possible, for example, for a family to start living in a house where a ghost is manifesting, and the ghost is causing stress on the family, which triggers somebody's PK, so poltergeist phenomena start happening even though they're not due to the ghost. And now that the family is primed to explain things in terms of a poltergeist, they start explaining every bump and knock and odd movement in these terms, even though many of them have natural causes. So in this case, you'd have RSPK and a spirit and a bunch of purely natural stuff. And competent investigators seek to untangle all of that when looking at a case. In fact, it's normal for field investigators to find that even when something paranormal is happening, there's also normal stuff that's being misinterpreted because once you encounter something paranormal, you start looking for it. And it's very easy to misunderstand normal things as paranormal ones when you're in that frame of mind. And since spirits appear to have PK, it could be that it's simply a spirit that's causing a poltergeist case, and there's no living agent whose RSPK is involved. The Sci Encyclopedia's article on poltergeists states, There are well-documented cases where no specific living agent was present during the manifestations, or where veridical information unknown to anyone present was given. Furthermore, communication with an apparent discarnate entity features in some cases suggesting that the origin of the force emanates from such an entity. Some cases, including the famous 1920 Pune, India episode, involve the appearance of a phantasm. An example involved Raymond Bayliss, a lifelong investigator of paranormal behavior, who told his wife that following his death, he would make himself known to her. Shortly after he died in 2004, his wife saw the back door of their home opening and closing on a regular basis. The effects seemed regular and purposeful, and not at all as if they were being caused by gusts of wind. On one occasion, she saw Raymond's form from the waist up in her hallway. It was somewhat fuzzy, but distinctly recognizable as her husband. Cases of this type lead some scholars to argue that poltergeist phenomena derive from discarnate agencies. Professor Eve Ian Stevenson, in a study to determine whether poltergeist activity stems from living agents or discarnate agencies, concluded, Neither always. Some poltergeists are living and others are dead. Gauld and Cornell considered the discarnate entity theory in some detail and concluded, We can see no grounds for dismissing the evidence in such cases on block, and are therefore constrained to admit that in such cases, it is appropriate to explore the discarnate entity hypothesis further and more fully. So even though RSPK is a promising hypothesis, each case needs to be evaluated individually to determine what the cause or causes of the poltergeist phenomena are. Having a poltergeist in your house may be very stressful. When field investigators encounter such a case, what kind of help can they offer the family? Are there ways of resolving the situation? There are, and the resolutions depend on the causes that the investigators uncover. To the extent that it turns out natural causes are responsible for what's happening, the resolution is basically education. Uh, you want to show them how the natural things are causing the experiences they're having, and that can be delicate if it turns out that there's an angsty teenager hoaxing the phenomena, because no parent likes to find out that their child is being deceptive and disruptive in that way. And what if the phenomena aren't entirely natural and a ghost is involved? 
To the extent that the phenomena are being caused by a ghost or a haunting, there are other resolutions that can be used. There are ways to try to get rid of a ghost or to disrupt a haunting, both of which we'll talk about in the future when we do episodes on those. In the case of ghosts, for example, you may be able to help the ghost move on in its journey in the afterlife. If it turns out that the ghost was in purgatory, you could do things to help it deal with that and move on. And even if the ghost doesn't go away at once, you may be able to help it in ways that modify its behavior so it isn't as destructive or frightening. We talked about that back in episode 113 on the Wizard Clip case. And ghosts often stop appearing once they finish whatever the task was they needed to perform. We talked about that in episode 164 on the Border Patrol ghost and in episode 174 on the Greenbrier ghost. So if you have like a ghost in purgatory and it's causing poltergeist phenomena to attract attention, well, maybe praying for it will help it move on. So what if evidence were to emerge that it isn't a human spirit, but an actual demon that's responsible? The thing to do in that case would be to call in the professionals and have an exorcism done. And what if it turned out that RSPK was responsible and that there was a living agent who was causing the poltergeist phenomena? In this case, there are a number of possible resolutions. One of the first steps is education, uh, helping the family understand the concept of RSPK, which is not as well known outside the parapsychological community. Despite Stephen King's carry, movies and TV shows haven't really explored RSPK the way they've covered ghosts or demons in connection with poltergeists. But helping the family understand what's happening would be a first step in dealing with it. A likely next step would be getting a counselor involved, either a counselor for the living agent or a counselor for the whole family to address the psychological stresses that are triggering the PK. In addition to counseling, other stress relieving options are also available, like helping the person find ways to relax or develop hobbies that will take down their stress level. Some possible ones include exercise, sports, or martial arts to give them physical stress release. And the living agent might not even want the PK to go away immediately. Why wouldn't they want to just have it stop? Because psychokinesis is an interesting phenomenon, and not a lot of people get to experience overt manifestations of it. As a result, some RSPK agents have been interested in learning if they can control the ability. And naturally, parapsychological researchers love to have subjects with significant PK abilities to study. So in some cases, they've gone into the lab and worked together uh, with the agent to see if they can harness the ability and channel it in a constructive direction that can aid further research. And who wouldn't want to be a Jedi? (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) So what if investigators have a hard time finding a resolution or set of resolutions that work in a particular poltergeist case? The good news is that even if they have trouble finding a single resolution, the phenomena are likely to stop on their own. Uh, One of the things we mentioned that characterizes poltergeist cases is that they tend to have a short duration. They're not like hauntings, some of which can go on indefinitely. Uh, Poltergeists are usually short-term phenomena. Indeed, they're sometimes finished before the parapsychologists are even brought in to investigate. Uh, They're not that common in the first place, and the fact they burn out so quickly has made them somewhat difficult to study, a point that's made in the Sci Encyclopedia's article on them. How long do they typically last? On the short end, according to William Roll, they may last for only a couple of weeks. On the long end, they have been known to go on for up to a year and a half, but that's not common. Also, there are cases where poltergeist phenomena may go on for longer or recur periodically, but usually the issue will resolve itself within a few weeks or months. And normally the family or the business, because poltergeists sometimes show up in stressful work situations, won't have to deal with it long term. So let's finish by going back to the Vienna workshop case that we started with. In light of what we've discussed, what do you think was happening there? It's hard to say because I don't have a lot of data about the case, just the article in the Science Encyclopedia. I Don't have a way to cross-check the information with other sources or visit the site and make my own observations. As a result, I have to take what the article says at face value and assume it's accurate and representative of what was going on. 
According to the author of the piece, who was an eyewitness, he and the others sought to exclude naturalistic explanations. They called in an expert to verify that the phenomena weren't being caused by electromagnetic currents from the guy next door with the dynamo. The author was convinced that objects were moving in a way that couldn't be explained by Herr Herr Zimmel or his apprentices. The objects also are described as moving in ways that wouldn't be caused by other naturalistic explanations. For example, Underground seismic vibrations or a tilted floor would not cause Herr Zimmerl's pipe to fly across the workshop and then fly back and come to rest on the anvil. Nor would they cause the pipe to suddenly stand upright after being in a horizontal position so that it's resting on the clay bowl at the end of its wooden stem and then suddenly move up and down making a peck motion that breaks the clay bowl. If these reports are accurate, it certainly appears that something paranormal was happening. And if so, what would be the most likely cause of the activity? Could it have been a spirit? It could have been, but we don't have good evidence for that. In fact, they brought in some spiritualists to try and contact spirits, and the article says the results were disappointing. They couldn't make contact with a spirit that seemed connected to the events. On the other hand, We have two young men on the scene, the about 15 and 18 year old apprentices, and that fits the common profile of a living agent case of RSPK. It's very possible that one of the apprentices was at a time of life when he was experiencing a lot of stress and frustration, and so he might have been psychokinetically acting out his frustrations. Any idea which apprentice might have been? There's not a lot of data, but based on what's there, if I had to guess, I'd guess it was the older one, the 18-year-old. The 15-year-old was struck by a flying object in the presence of the author's art of the author of the article, and the blacksmith, Herr Zimmerl, also had been struck. So maybe the 18-year-old was frustrated both with his boss and with his younger colleague, and they both got hit. At least it's a possibility, and it's the one I'd guess would be the most likely, given the limited data in the article. Okay, and so that brings us to our bottom line. Jimmy, what do you think causes poltergeists? All of the above. Based on the evidence I've read, I think that some poltergeist cases are simply natural. Some are best explained by hoaxes, uh, angsty teenagers acting out by surreptitiously throwing things. Others may be hoaxes orchestrated by adults to get attention or get a book or movie deal. Some are based on misperceptions of natural phenomena. But some are cases in which skilled investigators have been unable to find natural explanations for what's going on. And in some cases, there may be a spirit involved. But in other cases, recurrent spontaneous psychokinesis may be involved. All this is based on the reading and research I've done. In future episodes, we'll look more closely at individual poltergeist cases and see what we can figure out about them. Excellent. So, Jimmy, what are the further resources we can offer on this phenomena? We'll have links to Alan Gold's and A.D. Cornell's book, Poltergeists. That's the one with the big statistical analysis of 500 cases. We'll also have a link to William Roll's book, The Poltergeist, Lloyd Auerbach's book, ESP Hauntings and Poltergeists, a parapsychologist's handbook, uh, the article from the Sci Encyclopedia on Poltergeists, as well as uh, two more articles uh, from the Sci Encyclopedia, one on psychological aspects of poltergeist cases, and the other on the on the Vienna workshop poltergeist. Uh, we'll finally have an article called The Haunting That Wasn't, which describes Lloyd Auerbach's uh, investigation where he discovered that power lines were actually affecting a situation. Excellent. Really good. That was a lot of fun. Uh, so now it brings us to our mysterious feedback, which I said before will be from our two episodes about life on Mars. I want to remind folks that uh, we do have a mysterious feedback line now. And if you've tried in the past and gotten a wrong number, I apologize. I've uh, a couple of times read out the wrong number, uh, but the correct line is 619 738 Four five one five. I'll repeat that again toward the end of the episode. But we do have some uh, audio feedback that we've received from some listeners. And so the first one comes from Norman. Hello, Jimmy and Dom. I just finished listening to the Mars episode this week. It was very cool. I 
thought it was very interesting of all the canals. But you said that there used to be life on Mars, or there used to be a lot of water on Mars, but it all dried up and now it's a wasteland, which it is, even though it has ice. But why did it dry up? Do we know why it's a frozen wasteland when it used to be cool and full of water? Thank you. Love the show. So Mars used to have a much thicker atmosphere than it does now, but because Mars is small compared to Earth, it doesn't make as much gravity. It doesn't have as strong a gravitational attraction as Earth does, and so it's not able to hang on to that much gas. And so over time, Mars's atmosphere has largely leaked away into space. And what what happens when your atmosphere leaks away will affect stuff in the atmosphere like moisture. So one theory, uh, and I don't think there's any really any doubt that this is part of what happened to Mars's water, is a lot of it was carried off into space when the gravity of the planet couldn't hang on to the atmosphere and the, a lot of the atmosphere drifted away. Um, there's also a second theory, which is a bit more speculative, um, that's connected to that, that says one of the things, because Mars has these huge, massive dust storms, um, you know, like you see in The Phantom Menace, and um, and those, it's sp- speculated, may carry uh, some moisture from the surface to the upper atmosphere. And once it gets into the upper atmosphere, there's less gravity and it may drift off into space that way. So not only may be it not only may the water loss be due to losing atmosphere, but to getting moisture up into the upper atmosphere where it's easier to float away. Uh, then there's additional water that's on Mars that may have gone underground. And there's continuing research going on on this. And in fact, in our mysterious um Headlines will have a link to an article about what happened to uh, Mars's water and what the theories are about it. Okay. And our next bit of audio feedback comes from Chuck. Hi, Jimmy and Dom. This is Chuck from Alabama. My wife and I are big fans of the show. I've even been inspired to include a unit on the paranormal in my sociology of religion class. And I have the students listen to some episodes of the podcast. I was really inspired by your recent two-part episode on life on Mars. As I was listening, I was totally gobsmacked by the amount of evidence there is for life on Mars. And honestly, I feel like a part of my childhood had been stolen away from me because I was a huge fan of astronomy when I was a kid and even thought about being an astrophysicist. And if I had known that, that there was life on Mars, which apparently we've known since 1976, I think I would have been more influenced in that direction in terms of a career choice. In any case, it's really stunning that there's so much evidence and yet you continue to read articles saying we don't have proof of life on Mars. Um, so I'm wondering, why do you think this is? Why, why do we have so much evidence and yet the consensus in the scientific community continues to be that we haven't proven this? Could it be just a dramatic failure of the scientific community on one hand or some kind of conspiracy on the other? I'm actually not sure which outcome would be worse. What do you think? So um, I think that it is a failure uh, on the part of the scientific community. Now, in terms of seeing articles that say we don't have proof of life on Mars, that I'm somewhat open to because I think we've got a lot of evidence for life on Mars, but whether it's enough to count as proof at this stage, you know, where we haven't like brought a microbe back and looked at it under a microscope, I could, I could see, you know, people reasonably debating whether we have proof depending on what level of proof you want to use. Um, But I think it's ridiculous to read articles saying we have no evidence of life on Mars. No, we've got tons of it. And the um, I think that the uh, scientific community is very slow to change its opinions usually. And as as uh, as they say in the book, um, 13 things that don't make sense in science, fashion matters. (laughs) <laughs> and if you aren't going with the current fashion in science, you will be ostracized and um, your funding will dry up and you will be publicly 
pilloried in scientific publications, and it's bad news all around. So, um, you know, scientists sometimes are like the little chicks that will peck on chicks of another color um, and, and kind of bully them. And scientists do that, too, uh, with scientists that they disagree with. And so um, the good news is that corrects itself over time, but it tends to remain, but scientific views in a given area tend to remain stable for a fairly long period. Um, There's a famous book by a philosopher of science named Thomas Kuhn called The Structure of Scientific Revolutions. And in it, he talks about how once a given theory or a given view has become predominant in a scientific discipline, people will start finding evidence against it, and they'll kind of ignore that evidence in the beginning because they've, they're already committed to this view. And as evidence starts to mount against it, they'll either ignore the new evidence or they'll just do minor tweaks in the existing theory, but they'll still preserve the core of the existing theory. And so there's a resistance to changing the core of the theory. But then at some point, the new evidence becomes so overwhelming that the current theory collapses and is replaced by a new one. And that's what Kuhn referred to as a paradigm shift. And so science tends to be stable for a long period with minor modifications of a view until suddenly there's a paradigm shift because the counter evidence has gotten too great. And so... As So for a long time, the idea was Mars is just dead and we don't expect life anywhere in the solar system off of Earth. And so even though evidence has been mounting that that's not the case, to date, it's still been possible for scientists to like explain it away and say, oh, maybe this is caused by a geological process rather than a biological process. And so they're still in the let's ignore or explain away evidence mode. But if at some point we bring back a microbe that we can look at under a microscope, it will it will be a sudden paradigm shift and the there is no life on Mars view will collapse and be replaced by the view that there is or was life on Mars. Okay. Uh, We have another uh, feedback from Joyce the Trucker on YouTube who asks, why would the parameters of the experiment be changed after the results are in? Isn't that akin to bad or junk science? Well, ordinarily, yes. Uh, Changing the uh, way you evaluate an experiment after the data is in is a mark of bad science. Um, And the uh, you know, the author of the original experiment certainly thought so, that it should not be changed. Um, but uh, there can be situations where you realize later on, even though you've collected your data, oh, no, there's a huge design flaw in the experiment. And at that point, you either just chuck out all of your data or you try to repair the design flaw as best you can. And that's what the NASA higher-ups were trying to do by changing the criteria with the experiment, even though the data had been collected. And it's then a debate about was that the right move or was it not the right move? And so that's where the core of the issue is. But that's really what it comes down to is you either, once you've collected your data, if you think there's a design flaw, you either try to compensate for the design flaw or you have to chuck out the experiment altogether. The next one is an email and it says, my name is Joao Paulo. Sorry, (laughs) my Portuguese isn't very good. Uh, I'm a Salesian novice in Brazil. I came across the writings of the venerable André Beltrami, a Salesian priest that lived from the years 1870 to 1897. He wrote in a book titled Venial Sin, a reflection about extraterrestrial intelligent life in which he writes, Are the other stars inhabited by intelligent beings? Are such creatures out there in passage or to purify themselves? Can our prayers and our sacrifices, purified by the blood of Christ, rise like incense to the Creator's throne and descend, transformed into rain, beneficial to his needs? I believe that we are able to put that intention to our prayers and meritorious works. That is, we are able to go to the aid of such intelligent creatures. If they exist and can be helped by us, they all are also children of God and our brothers. A soul who loves finds this earth very small and seeks in all angles of creation 
ways to glorify God. Alexander, in his ambition, feels that there are no more kingdoms to conquer. The holy ambition of godly people is to expand the kingdom of God and to conquer for their kind service all beings capable of knowing and loving him, whether they inhabit our planet or the sparkling stars of the firmament, because they find little to do glory that he receives from the creatures. So, um, Venerable Andre Beltrami um, has an open mind on the question not only of whether extraterrestrial life exists and whether it can be intelligent, but he also advocates even not knowing whether it exists. He advocates praying for uh, praying for the aliens, and uh, I think that's a fine idea. People may be surprised to know this, but actually, it, before the 20th century, there was quite a lot of discussion of the extraterrestrial hypothesis, and um, and the 19th century was a particularly uh, fruitful period of discussion on whether there was life on other worlds, and we will be talking about that in the future. Mm. Uh, Kevin sends an email, says, I have a question about why the establishment may be flip-flopping or withholding confirmation of life, even though it may be microbial. Do you think the powers that be may not confirm its existence because it would challenge the fundamentalist Christian view that we are alone in the universe? As a former fundamentalist that became Catholic 11 years ago, I was firmly in the camp of God created the earth in six 24-hour cycles, and it was the only place he created life and any evidence to the contrary could be explained away as man's misunderstanding of the evidence or diabolical deception. Um, I think it's possible that uh, opposition by fundamentalists or other Christians who would, you know, really have a problem with this is perhaps playing something of a role in the reluctance to, you know, conclude that there's life on Mars. But I think it's more due to the paradigm shift uh, model that uh, Thomas Kuhn uh, proposed that, um, you know, as long as scientists aren't forced to change their views on this subject, it's easier and safer and hipper for them to have the respect of their scientific peers and colleagues and get funding by not rocking the boat on this until it becomes unavoidable. Uh, the next is a comment from YouTube from JJ, who writes, I think it's pretty clear now that Jimmy leans toward believing the topics. It's really disappointing that he didn't bring up any arguments or state he couldn't find any. To the contrary, not everything has to be a controversy. It doesn't make sense NASA or any other scientists would be trying to conceal life on Mars, because if there was a strong possibility, then funding for Mars missions, manned and unmanned, would be so easy to get. So um, I, uh, I appreciate the critique from JJ, and if I went back and re-listened to the episodes, I might conclude that maybe I could have done a few additional things to uh, throw bones to the skeptical side. I, in the first episode in particular, because uh, this was a two-parter, I talked about how I, I offered more reasons why there was not life. And we followed the story as the evidence mounted that there it was less and less likely that there was life. That, you know, we, we talked about how, okay, eventually it's discovered the canals are not filled with water and there is not a lot of water or, you know, free oxygen in Mars's atmosphere. And its atmosphere turns out to be way thinner than we thought. And, um, and how by the 1960s, you had probes getting there that weren't showing us life. And so we tried to cover those. Now, I didn't want to get too far into like chemistry arguments because, they could be dull um, and hard to communicate in an audio format. And so um, I, I, I wanted to gesture in those directions and I wanted to track the case against life sort of in the first episode of here's all the evidence about this is a really harsh planet. It's a desert wasteland and so forth. But then I wanted to tell the story of the mounting evidence in the second episode. And so part of the conclusion you may or an impression you may have here, JJ, may be due to focusing on the second episode uh, rather than on the first. But, uh, you know, I might have I might could have been able to uh, include some more of the skeptical perspective. 
part of me wanted, though, because I knew a lot of people are skeptical, I kind of wanted to, you know, hit people with, wait, there's way more evidence that you're than you're aware of just to make that point. And um, and so, uh, you know, I because I, I knew that that in order to get this a fair hearing with some folks, they would need to kind of be hit with a bunch of evidence and too much going back and forth between positive and, and negatives could have um, impaired it could have caused the point to get lost that there's a lot more evidence here than you think. Uh, Reuven on Facebook writes, I honestly thought that I would find this pair of episodes to be, well, a filler until you two got to more interesting topics. But part two was absolutely phenomenal. I've never been more interested in the question of non-terrestrial life than after listening to your episode. Frankly, I've never really been interested in the question before this episode. If you'll pardon the pun, you both have done stellar work on this episode. You managed to tell a very interesting, well-evidenced, and even human story about an old space rock and a bunch of half-functioning robots. Thank you. I And I love that image of an old space rock and a bunch of half-functioning robots. It sounds like a great setting for a science fiction story. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, Henry writes on YouTube, I think the length of the feedback section has been slowly growing, and honestly, I'm glad. Hearing you respond to feedback is one of my favorite parts of the show. Also, the first response was the kindest, most charitable, stop being a bigot I've ever heard. <laughs> so Henry is referring to uh, an interaction in a previous feedback segment on the 9-11 attacks where someone was um, attributing the attacks to Zionists in a way that seems to be using Zionist as a substitute for Jews. And I tried to interact as charitably as I could with that. So thank you. And yeah, sometimes the feedback, I mean, we get a ton of feedback on the show and most of the time, and I can't use all of it. I wish I could, um, but this would become the mysterious feedback show if that was the case. And I'm, I, it's a, uh, continual bit of a struggle to find the best way to include feedback and find places in it because some of our episodes already are longer treatments of mysteries and we may not have time for feedback in a given episode and it can bunch up in the episodes with shorter mysteries. Uh, Tobby12347 on YouTube writes, I really enjoyed this episode. I normally just download the podcast, but you've really caught my attention with the incredible improvement in video production. Keep up the amazing work. Thank you. And I want to say a special thank you to John and Jessica Byers, who are doing the post-production on the uh, video. And uh, you can see it at YouTube.com slash Jimmy Aiken. And when you go by, please do uh, subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications to uh, hear whenever future videos come out on my channel, whether Mysterious World or not. I am trying to grow my channel. We're around 25,000 uh, subscribers right now, and I'd love to get that up. So thank you very much. Chris writes on YouTube, another great episode, guys. So glad you're doing these with video now. It's been a goal of ours for a long time to do it, and we're really uh, fortunate to have the buyers helping us out, and they bring a lot to the uh, quality of the video. Yep. And we're all working hard to always improve to make the show better and better for the listeners. Yes. So Christian writes on YouTube, hey, Jimmy, I love watching these episodes with my dad and my two brothers on the drive to school. So I'm glad you enjoy them. And that comment will sound different in 20 years. <laughs> And since I'm older, it sounds different. It would have sounded different 20 years ago. 20 years ago, talking about watching shows while you're driving to work or school is like, what? How is that possible? Um, but now it is possible. And 20 years from now, it will be normal because we'll be using self-driving cars and nobody will have to pay attention to the road so everybody can watch. Right. Uh, Midwest Nagifa on YouTube writes, I love the possibility of life on Mars, and I find it totally convincing that there are microbes, but I don't really see the evidence there from the aerial photos that we have. Isn't the mapping of Mars pretty complete by now and orbital surveys haven't turned up macro scale life? Well, um, 
This is one of the disputes. Uh, there are things on the surface of Mars that to many people's eyes look like life um, than there are on the macro scale. But because of the resistance to paradigm shift, you have people saying, ah, maybe this is geology producing these weird lifelike structures rather than biology producing them. And then Leon Carruthers writes on YouTube, this is tough. As much as I'd love to find life on Mars, many of the proposed greening the red planet strategies would be genocide to enact if there were any life there already. Well, I don't know that I'd qualify them as genocide. I tend to think of genocide as applying to uh, intelligent creatures. Otherwise, you're just causing something to go into extinction. But it's not genocide if like you killed every bat-winged, red-spotted gerbil termite. <laughs> you know, if you'd wiped out a species of termites, I, that's not genocide. That's just causing it to go to extinction. But that is a significant thing. And so if it turns out that there's life on Mars, then, yeah, we're going to have some serious thinking to do about what it's not only what it's safe to do on the planet because that life might be able to hurt us um but also what it's moral to do on the planet because at that point we have a second planet under human conservatorship just like in the beginning god gave our species conservatorship of this planet if we go to mars and there's no intelligent life there but since we're intelligent now that planet is something we have responsibility for as well and thinking about what can we legitimately do here because we don't want to just wipe out all kinds of martian life some people are of the opinion that if there's anything there that's native we should just leave the whole planet alone um i I don't know that that is the conclusion I would come to, but it's a conclusion I'm open to hearing argued. And that's the question that Flying Car 100 asks on YouTube. If there is life on Mars, would that mean we have to stop sending probes there? I don't think we'd have to stop sending probes because we already have planetary protection measures um, to sterilize the probes we send. And so it, we might want to ramp up our sterilization methods before we send a probe just to prevent low-scale infection, uh, infecting Martian life. But um, I don't think we'd have to stop the probes. What we might have to do is stop the colonization. Right. And so Joseph on YouTube writes, in the future, when the first colony is established on Mars, a man and a woman will start dating. Eventually, the man will decide to pop the question. He will get down on one knee and will open the ring box while asking his girlfriend, Babe, is there wife on Mars? And that's how the first Martian couple will get married. And any woman who, single woman who is geeky enough to be one of the first women on Mars, I'm sure will appreciate the pun. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I certainly do. Dylan writes on YouTube, shout out to my theology teacher for having me watch these videos every week. This stuff is actually interesting. Well, thank you, Dylan. We're glad you are enjoying it. And thank you to your theology teacher as well for encouraging his students to uh, listen. Uh, we cover loads of subjects here on Mysterious World. And so teachers of almost any field are probably going to be able to find something that their students might benefit from and find interesting. So teachers out there, please do uh, help the podcast out and help your students discover something that they w might find interesting and that could contribute to their education. Very good. Thank you, everyone, for that awesome feedback. So, Jimmy, what do we have for Mysterious Headlines this month? Well, I thought I'd give us, since we just had feedback about life on Mars, I thought I'd give us a life on Mars update. So the first uh, link we'll have is to that article I mentioned for um, how did Mars lose its water? And there are some new theories and developments on that involving the Perseverance rover that's over there. Also, we'll have an article because I, I do want to give both sides to every story. There was recently an, um, a study that did, uh, once again, try to explain the original Martian meteorite from 1984 as not having actual signs of life in it, but shapes that were caused by geological processes and chemical processes. And so you can read about this new study suggesting that. On the other hand, there's another new study um, suggesting that the uh, 
that there is a strong carbon signal on Mars that involves the kind of carbon that life likes to use because there's more than one isotope of carbon and life has a preference. And this new carbon signal uh, from Mars has been hailed as once again, supporting the possibility of life there. So you can read about that. And then lastly, Mars is not the only place where there might be life in the solar system besides Earth. I actually think there are a number of places, but but one of them that we've mentioned at least briefly on the show before is Venus, specifically not the surface of Venus where it's too hot and too pressury, but in the atmosphere of Venus. And so we'll have a link from astronomy now or from astronomy.com on the case for life on Venus and a private mission that is trying to find it because oftentimes the best way to get something done is do it yourself and not wait for government bureaucrats to do it. <laughs> That's right. So that's it for our headlines, and that's it from us. We would love to hear your feedback on your theories about poltergeist. What do you think? You can let us know by visiting sqpn.com or the Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World Facebook page, or send an email to mysterious at sqpn.com, sending a tweet to at mys underscore world, or calling our mysterious feedback line at 619 738 4515. That's 619-738-4515. So, Jimmy, what are we talking about next time? Next time, we're going to be answering patrons' questions about subjects like baptizing robots, the Shroud of Turin, cryptids like the Jersey Devil and Sky Jellyfish, bringing back extinct animals and books that didn't make it into the Bible and more. Excellent. Folks, remember to like this episode of Jimmy Akin's Mysterious World, where you find it on Facebook or retweet it on Twitter and get the word out. You can find links to Jimmy's resources from our discussion and links to the mysterious headlines on our show notes at sqpn.com slash mysterious. And remember, to help us continue to produce the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World is also brought to you in part by Amagara Marungi. As Africa has become a leading source of priests to support the church in the United States, Amagara Marungi reciprocates by sending financial support. As they have supported our financial needs, we support the physical needs of the poor, orphans, widows, and the elderly of these communities that have sent their sons to us. You can join their mission of bringing a better life to these communities by visiting amagaramarungi.org or sqpn.com slash help Africa. That's sqpn.com slash help Africa. Until next time, Jimmy Aiken, thank you for exploring with us our mysterious world. Thanks, Dom. And once again, I'm Dom Bettinelli. Thank you for listening to Jimmy Aiken's Mysterious World on StarQuest. Quest.